Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Again, looking at this uh, last week, we took a contextual look at Paul's defense of his ministry. Seems kind of an odd thing to talk about Paul defending his ministry, does it not? <coughs> Think about that for a minute. Who is the most commented on? Who is the most read? Who is the most discussed? Who is the most argued about person who's ever lived? Let's take Christ out of the equation for a second. Who's, if it's Christ, who's, who's next? It's, it, ha it has to be Paul. It has to be. If it's not Paul, I'd like to know who is next. Be inter interesting to hear that. And here he is defending his ministry to a bunch of people who we don't even know the names. And yet he felt it was necessary, and I trust we'll see why this morning, why he does this. Because Paul doesn't care how big his own name is. He's out to minister, he's out to build the body of Christ. At any cost to himself. That's what I think we'll see this morning. We saw that Paul was discussing relationships last week, the Corinthians, and all Christians have relationships with new believers, with unbelievers, within the family, and later... We'll see in this book in a congregational meeting. All about relationships. How do we relate to each other? How do we relate to that new believer that might be have a conscience attack, if you will, because he sees you eating meat offered to an idol in a in a worship ceremony? Later on, we're going to see the same question comes up at home or at the market. How do we relate to Paul himself, as we'll see here? How do we relate to unbelievers? We saw that earlier. All relationships here, now today, it's how do we relate to Paul. Here, Paul was teaching regarding the relationship to him. Some doubted his status as an apostle. He now sends, spends chapter 9 defending his status as, as an apostle. Verse 1, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle and others yet doubt will say unto you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. And so we know there were people questioning his status as an apostle in that church. So he's going to defend himself. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife as to also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas, or Peter? Or is it only Barnabas I have no right to refrain from working? And we'll go through verse 10. Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same thing also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not puzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about, or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. Well, Paul's actually going to spend the rest of the chapter in this line of thinking, and in this line of uh, defense, if you will. But why is it here, and what does he have to say for us today? Well, let's start with a few, shall we say, opening remarks. And there's some points that we're going to try to make today, especially on verses 9 and 10, that have to do with the rights of the minister. But the point of today, as you see in your bulletin today, is that um, the the right of the minister, or Christian ministers, have a right to the fruits of their labor. They do have that right. Paul's going to make that abundantly clear. I do know some Christian ministers who say that the minister should not get paid at all. I've, I've heard that. 
I believe Paul is arguing against that. But what he's arguing against is that it, is it just because he has the right to be paid does not mean that he now has the responsibility to receive payment. Okay, please get the distinction. The right to be paid doesn't mean that he has to take it. If he wants to minister as an apostle at his own expense, he can still do that. That's what he's arguing here. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife as do the other apostles? See, the other apostles apparently did take along a believing wife. And they were saying, well, Paul, you're not, if you were a real apostle, you'd have, you'd have, you'd be married. You'd be taking along a wife. So I don't, I don't have to do that in order to be apostle. And then in verse 6, says, only Barnabas and I have no right to, to refrain from working. Now, some people believe that Barnabas was a tent, tent maker just like Paul. They get that out of the book of Acts. I couldn't get that myself. But apparently Barnabas didn't work with his hands. We know from Acts chapter 20 that Paul said that these hands, his own hands, and those who were with him, his own hands, supported the ones who ministered to the church at Ephesus. If you ever want a defender of working with your hands, it's Paul. Paul knows how to do it. I mean, and you have to really think about that. This is worthy of a sermon on its own. But the most... It's amazing to me. It's, it's still amazing. I, I st I, I, I've thought about this for years. And I'm still amazed at the most influential man who ever lived, probably or possibly. Certainly, again, the most argued about, the most discussed, the most commented on. Man who ever lived defended working with one's hands. You have to really consider that. You have to think about that a little bit. If ever there was a man who said, you know what? Let's spend the rest of our lives in the ivory tower studying the original languages. Nothing wrong with studying the original languages. It's a good thing if Paul knew them. But if there's ever a man who could defend that, it would have been Paul. And yet Paul worked with his hands to the point where the Corinthians were now saying, you know what? If you were a real life apostle, if you really knew what you were talking about, if you could really minister to us, you'd be like those other people who don't work with their hands. And Paul's saying here, the fact that I and Barnabas work doesn't take away from our ability to minister to you. In fact, he's going to argue later on that it helps it and assists it. Obviously, this has some um, application for us here at Independence Reform Bible Church, does it not? I have a uh, full-time job that I that I work, and um, as does as does John. And we've discussed some of these questions. In fact, um, we've recently discussed it again, very, very briefly. Someone could say that I'm not a real pastor because I don't take a full-time salary. And Paul's going to argue here that the fact of whether or not I get paid, that's, that's not the test. The fact is, here this church does uh, share in my expenses, for sure. It does pay me a small salary. Um, good luck trying to get John to take a, take a small salary. Um, that's, that's really pretty hard to do. Um, can't get him to take anything. But that doesn't mean that John can't and doesn't minister. But that is Paul's point here. The fact that you have the right to receive the fruits of the labor does not mean that you have to indulge in them. Now, a few remarks here as we, as we look at this. First of all, this church was started in an odd way. Let's look at it, 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 for, for Carthay, but let's look back at the Acts 18, please. I'm going to argue here that we, we still underestimate working with one's hands. It doesn't mean that you have to work with your hands. It doesn't mean that. But it also doesn't mean that we can't that we look down on people who do work with their hands. Look at this. Now, chapter 18, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went from Corinth. Now, remember, he just um, got thrown out of Athens. He was just with the hot shots. He was just with the people that sat around. They, they, they were terrified of working with their hands, these people that he was with at, at Athens. And in fact, we know from writings from Alan Schmidt and others that in a slave society, 
working with her hands is looked down on. Why? Because you are a loser if you work with your hands because you don't even have a slave who can do that work with your hands. You just use your head. They look down at Athens, all those philosophers sitting around. They look down at people who work with their hands. You know what Paul does? Look what he does. He leaves Athens, and look at this. He departs from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, Aquila probably a Hellenistic Jew, a convert, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Claudius had commanded all the Jews apart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation, they were tent makers. I'm not sure. I, I This is a little bit of speculation. I don't know. It almost seems as if Paul got out of Athens with all those hot shots. And as it said, they, they had nothing to do except sit around and try to dream up some new thing. And Paul, it, it almost seems like he breathed a big sigh. Let me get away from these people. And let me just work with my hands a little bit and clear my head. Don't know. But it sort of, sort of seems that way because of the way it's, it's listed here. He leaves there, and the first thing he does is start making tents. Not the only thing, though. This is the key. It's not the only thing that he did. Because look at verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Silas and Timothy come from Macedonia. He's, he's testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. <laughs> and uh, there's all kinds of problems. There's a uh, Gentile by the name of Christmas who's converted there in verse 7. And this is the beginning of the Church of Corinth. It was begun, this Church of Corinth, ministered to all these people who, wealthy it appears, many, many wealthy people it appears were at Corinth. Many, I'm sure, own slaves. And Paul is ministering to these people as a worker with his hands. And some are not going to appreciate it. Well, that's how the church gets started. Paul is making tents. Secondly, I want you to see something that Paul doesn't always do in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians if we go back there. But he answers questions by asking them. It is legitimate to do that at times. Sometimes we just have to give a straight answer. Sometimes we do. There's other times when we have to clarify in the questioner's mind just exactly what they're asking. We have to teach them to ask the right question. And look what he says in verse 3. My defense to those who examine me is this. That's verse 3. So we expect to see a defense. Instead, we see a series of questions that levels out almost like a machine gun. Rat, rat, rat. He, he's piling questions on top of questions here. Why is he doing this? He's trying to teach the Corinthians how to ask the right questions. That's the second thing we see. These are just some opening observations here. Thirdly, it is striking what Paul says about his apostleship throughout this chapter. It's also striking what he doesn't say. Now here he is talking about his apostleship. And he says, you know, if I'm not an apostle, other, I, other people I have to you. So what are you worried about? But this is not the way I would have defended my apostleship if it were me. If it were I. Look at Acts 13 for me, with you? Or with me, William. Look at this. Thirteen one. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers: Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, "Now separate to me Barnabas, Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them." Now, if you're depending your apostleship. And you're Paul, Saul, or Paul, Saul at the time. That's where I'm going. I'm going right here. So, you guys question whether I'm an apostle? Right here. Anybody ever tell you about Antioch? 
Anybody ever tell you what went on up there with me and Barnabas? The Holy Spirit talked to everybody and told me to do this job. Now, what's your problem, Corinthians? Why does he not say that? Of, of all the qualifications, why does he leave this one out? As he defends himself here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I think there's a lot of reasons, but the one that I'm going to have to give you, if you will, is I, I believe Paul was that kind of a guy who, shall we say, he was always trying to make the team, if you will. He was never, ever going to sit back on his past laurels. Oh, yeah, he was going to mention a few things. But he was just going to keep trying, he was going to keep working, he was going to keep laboring every single day. And isn't that the way our lives work anyway, folks? Moms, can you take the day off with the kids? So, you know, kids, I've been doing this for years. You know I'm a good mom. You know, for the next two weeks, you're on your own. I've worked, and you can't say I'm not a good mom. I've done my job. I'm taking a break for two weeks. You kids are running the house. You can't do that. If you're in business, especially small business, every day, you're going to be out there. You can't coast. And Paul, or Saul, well, Saul at the time, but Paul, I think he's doing the same thing here. That's what he's saying throughout here. He's saying, I work, I labor. Every day I do this. Every day I'm trying to make the team. Now, he's not trying to make the team, of course. But he's acting like he's trying to make the team. He knows there's work to be done every day, and he's going to do it. And yesterday was yesterday, and he's thankful for what God has done for him yesterday. But... That's not going to do anything for him today. You know, verse 27 says that very thing. If you look at it at the end of chapter 9. But I discipline my body and bring it in subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should be, should be disqualified. I don't think that means lost. But I think what he's saying there is, you want to talk about my disqualification for being an apostle? I'll tell you when that disqualification will come, when I don't work at it anymore, when I don't do the job that I'm supposed to do. I believe this applies to pastors every bit as much. Does any time ever come the pastor gets to sit back and say, you know what? I've ministered for all these years. I've done my job. I've sat over the board meetings when they argued about what color to paint the nursery and how many stalls to put in the new bathrooms. I've done all my thing. Now I'm going to retire. Now I'm done. I don't think so. If you're going to serve, if you were really serving Christ back then, why aren't you serving Him now? And Paul sure sounds here like he's going to serve Christ every minute of his life until he's dead. Pastors, I don't believe has that option anytime to say, you know what, I'm just done. I sure don't see it with Paul. I don't see the scriptures anywhere with anyone. Well, let's take a look here. At, those are some opening remarks. Let's take a quick look at Paul's kind of dual defense here in verses um, 7 through 10. Let's read them again, just 7 through 10. Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same thing also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Or is it oxen that God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. This is written that he who plows should plow in hope. He who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. Kind of overuses the word hope there in verse 10. And we'll take a look at that in a minute, why he, why he does that. First of all, Paul is calling them two witnesses here in 7 through 10. The one witness is what they know already. And the second witness is what the law says. So he's arguing from their own knowledge, if you will, what they already accept. It's a good way to argue. Say, so you guys are challenging my apostleship because I don't take money like everybody else does. But you yourselves know that I have the right to do that. So what's your problem with it? 
Look at this. He calls on three separate um, entities, if you will. Whoever goes to war at his own expense, and who plants a vineyard and does not eat of his fruit? He, he's, he's, he's given us a dual um, presentation, if you will. Um, whenever someone plants a vineyard, or, 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 or and this, this example is used in the scripture an awful lot, you don't plant without full expectation, we'll see this in verse 10, of a a, a, a benefit of that plant, right? Whether it's corn or wheat or a vineyard. You plant a seed and you expect the seed to grow. It's like sort of guaranteed. Not so with going to war, is it? Whoever goes to war is at his own expense. When you go to war, are you guaranteed to come out successful? Absolutely not. You see, so he's, he's comparing his apostleship to, to two things, if you will. He doesn't know what's going to come out, uh, come out of his work. He, he flat out doesn't, doesn't know who's going to be a believer, who's not. He doesn't know if he's going to get beat up or if it's going to be somebody else. By now, well, of course, this was earlier on in his ministry. By the time Paul's ministry was over with, it seemed like he couldn't go anywhere without somebody getting hurt. Usually it was Paul. Sometimes it was somebody else. But he didn't know exactly what was going to happen. But he did know that the seeds that were planted were going to grow. He just didn't know where those seeds were all the time. He didn't know what they were. He didn't know what they would look like. So he's using two kind of opposite illustrations. One illustration where you don't know what's going to happen at all. You go to battle, who knows? I don't know a whole lot about military history. I do know one thing. I mean, when you study battles, battles never go the way they're supposed to go. Never. There's always something that happens on both sides that someone didn't anticipate. That's the way it is in war. Different from planting a vineyard, planting a field. You kind of know what's going to happen. So Paul's saying these two things go on in my ministry all the time. I go out there every day, I don't know what's going to happen, I don't know, but I do know this. The seeds that are planted will definitely come to fruition. And he's saying that as well to make the point that um, but he makes it the third point there. Whoever tends a flock and doesn't, doesn't um, drink of the milk of the flock. That was one of the ways that people were paid. They weren't always paid in coin. Shepherds, as we pointed out before, were some of the poorest people in any society. Exceptionally poor. If they could get a better job, they would. How would you like to be the person to be outside all the time? Remember Patrick of Ireland? That was his job as a slave, you remember? He was a slave. Only he had to only he had to herd pigs. Can you imagine that? I mean, herding cattle or herding goats or herding sheep would be one thing. Herding pigs? You've got to be kidding. But in any case, Paul says, whoever tends a flock and doesn't and doesn't get, get the benefits of tending that flock. You're my flock. I have a right to the benefits of those flocks. It, it, it has to do with my work with you. Not whether or not I have a job out there, or whether or not I'm making tents, or whether or not I bring a wife along with me, or even if I'm married. My benefits have directly to do with the work that I do. That's where my benefits come from. The work that I do. Now why does he say this, or how do we know this? Well, because of his next illustration. Look at this next illustration that he brings up. It's probably what I would argue is the worst illustration possible. He says, I, I have a right because, um, check this out. The law says, you should not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Paul, you kidding me? <laughs> we, we were just talking about you being paid for what you do and you being benefiting from, from your work. You're going to talk to me about oxen and grain and muscle. What are you talking about, Paul? And Paul's going to make an application that is lost on most of North American Christianity today. Lost. He asks the question again. Verse, uh, verse 9. Is it oxen that God is concerned about? Uh... Was this just 
strip peroxin. He answers in verse 10, doesn't he? Or is it all, or does he say it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. Now, my friends, we don't have a whole lot of time to talk about this, but I hope you don't forget this point. Is that if Paul can take an illustration from the Old Testament and apply it to his ministry in the New Testament, and an illustration that was written to oxen, can we not take the old same Old Testament and apply it to us today? Especially when it's written to people. Now, yes, there are challenges to our applications. But let's do the work of those challenges, shall we not? Rather than just write them off. And I've had people say that to me. Hey, Joel, you can't answer every question about the Old Testament. No, you're right, I can't. But I think if Paul takes an illustration written to oxen, or about oxen, and applies it to his own ministry, and we heard this morning, this is not the only time he does it. Did you hear this morning? He does the same thing with Timothy. He uses this illustration twice. If we can do that, if we can take an illustration written for oxen and apply it to us, let's work hard. Let's not give up. Let's sink our teeth and do all of Scripture and apply it. Because we all we, we know that's all profitable, right? And we glibly quote, all Scripture is given by information and inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, for proof, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we say with some of our doctrinal statements, that this is inapplicable, this huge portions of the Old Testament, because it's the Old Testament. Well, wait a minute, whatever happened to all Scripture? Whatever happened to it? Paul here is really giving us quite a lesson, I, I believe. This is an absolute lesson. <laughs> Something written for the ox, and he's going to apply it to his own ministry. Amazing. Nothing short of amazing as far as I'm concerned. Now, I want to explain something else here, if I can. And I want to talk about this problem that we seem to have in Christian churches. This idea of creeping socialism, if you will, that's always at the fringes of Christianity. And people wonder, they say, well, you know, why, you know, why is it that we can't be like the early church and have all things in common and just share and so forth? And you know what? We can share. And we have shared. And if you've ever seen when there is a disaster somewhere, it's almost always the Christians who are first on the scene. I still remember a young friend that I had uh, went down to um, the disaster that was uh, Hurricane Katrina. I say disaster because there was plenty of water coming from above and coming, plenty of water coming from the ground too. When I say the ground, it wasn't gushing up from the ground, but when you build a city that's below sea level, <laughs> you might eventually have a problem with water. Which is what they did. In any case, my friend went down with some others, and um, he told me later, down with Katrina, went down with water. He said it was a pretty amazing time, at least the experience he had. Now, I've talked to other people who went and ministered, and they didn't have quite the same experience. But he had an amazing experience. He said, first of all, the orga organizing for who needed help the most was done, can you guess where, at the local church. And can you guess by whom? The local pastor. See, there were people coming to minister. They wanted to help. But when you go into a disastrous situation like that, who do you help? What do you, you, you have to get your bearings together. And this, this local pastor knew whom to help. Not only that, but he told me about a church. He said it was from Florida. Now, have you ever seen these trucks? I don't even know what the name of them are. Have you ever seen? Have you ever seen these trucks? They look like a like a, a like a pickup truck on steroids. They've got um, they, they've got all these uh, uh, toolbox things. They've got welders. They've got cranes. Have you ever seen one of these things? 
Um, it, it, it's, it's, like a, it's like a Swiss Army knife truck. It, it has everything on it. And he said, this, they, they came, he said these people, guys from Florida, about 20 guys who were construction guys, he said nothing stood in their way. They were out cutting down trees, they were out building things, they were out working their head. They were from a church in Florida. I asked them, I said, well, what was the um, um, disaster? What's, what, what, uh, come on, the, um, uh, FEMA. FEMA, yeah, FEMA, thank you. What was FEMA doing? Because they're the ones with all the credit, right? Got to have FEMA on the scene. I said, what were they were doing? He said, well, he said, I, I, the whole time I was there, I did see two FEMA guys. They had clipboards, and they were writing things down. <laughs> FEMA, FEMA gets the credit while the church does the real work. Well, what, what, what am I talking about? The, the fact of the matter is that throughout history, it's the Church of Jesus Christ that has been on the scene. You know, the Red Cross is a cross for a reason. You ever read about the Swiss and the development of the St. Bernards, for example? What are they called St. Bernards? It's because the Swiss believers, Swiss Christians, develop those dogs to be able to rescue people. The illustrations are so extensive. If you want more, read Alvin Schmidt's book. Uh, called um, How Christianity Changed the World. But there's there's so much there about what Christians are So people say, well, why aren't Christians, why aren't Christians socialists? Well, first of all, because if you're all socialists, you can't help your neighbor anyway, because you have nothing. But look at what it actually says. And this verse here tells us something, and we can't ignore it. The laborer is don't muzzle the ox while it treads out the corn. Is an ox that God is concerned about? Look, verse 10. Where does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes of doubt is written that he who plows should plow in hope. He who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. Guess who gets the benefit of the work? The one who did it. It never says anything like, you know, we have an ox treading out the corn. Let's take his grain away and give them all the oxen who aren't treading out the corn. No, the ox who's treading out the corn gets the benefit of the corn. Christ said himself in Luke 10, 7. Let's look at it. Check this out. It's Christ himself. This is too important to just reference. Let's look at it. Luke 10. He's sending the disciples out. Let's start in verse 5. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. Verse 6 of Luke 10. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And verse 7. They remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Guess who gets the wages? The laborer. They're spread around everybody else who's not working. This is a principle throughout the scriptures here. And if you want to just go to one single passage in, in Acts, you can do that. Easily explained. But take all of scripture, and this principle is throughout the Bible. It's the laborer, it's the one who, who works who gets it. The farmer, Paul says in another place, is the one who gets the benefit. Now let's look back at verse 10 and see how, of 1 Corinthians 9, and see how Paul explains this. Does he say it all together for our sakes? No, he says it for us, because he so that he who plows and should plow in hope, he who thrusts in hope should be partaker of this hope. What kind of hope are we talking about here? Hope for what? Hope. We use the word hope as some kind of like a roll of the dice, don't we? But that's not the way this word is used. This this word really means more like expectation. Or waiting for something to happen. A sure and solid expectation. 
the type of expectation that you have when, let's see, uh, okay, you're playing softball. Somebody pops it up. Do you hope that the ball eventually comes down? It pops it up. Oh, hopefully the ball come down someplace. No, that's, that's not. You don't say that. You know it's coming. You expect it to come down. If you're on the other team, you try to get under and catch the ball. That's what's being said right here. It's expectation. It's written, he who plows in hope should plow in hope or an expectation. He who threshes in hope should be partaker of the same hope or that same expectation. See, Paul's using very strong language here. He's saying, I'm not going out and just spreading around my skills, my ability, my whatever, and just hoping that things work out. No. I know that my work here is going to have some type of benefit. And yes, I do have the right to that benefit. Now, what's that have to do with, with all of us? Well, first of all, I, I hope that we can, as Christians, oppose this creeping socialism thing in, in every area because it's ungodly and it's unbiblical. You know what? I've known, I have known Christian businessmen. And I have known them to be generous people. In, in my experience. I'm sure there are some that are not. But in my experience, they've been extremely generous people. And you know what? With their money, they can spread it around to whoever they, wherever they want to. If I'm not working, and I'm not doing my job, that, my neighbor Christian businessman has no responsibility to give me money whatsoever because it's his. The laborer is worthy of his hire. The laborer is worthy of his, his hire. We see no place where it's said that everybody else is worthy of the laborer's hire. We don't see that. We see the laborer's worthy of his hire. Secondly, though, I'm going to talk to those of you, maybe, maybe younger folks, who knows, that are considering perhaps the ministry. Maybe you are. Maybe some of your older folks are considering it. It's a good thing that if you consider this, and you should think about it. And we're all ministers in some level, anyway, I don't care who you are. You're some type of a minister, but we're talking now strictly in terms of ministering the gospel. What's Paul telling the rest of us here? Well, let's ask this question. What were apostles if not ministers? Ministers are more than preachers, more than administrators, more than listeners. See, what do we want when we want a pastor? What are we saying? What's your description of a good pastor? Good listener, maybe? Good preacher, interesting guy, good administrator, knows how to grow a church. Pretty wife. People think of these things. All right, at least I'm qualified to run. All right. It, but it's the same. It's the same. What are ministers ultimately? Paul and Barnabas were what ministers are supposed to be. Life sharers. I tried to think of a better word this week better than that. I couldn't think of one. I know there's a better word out there. They ultimately don't just share the time. Ministers their knowledge and their experience. They share their lives, as we will see in the next few weeks. But I just want to read... For you, if you'll read with me. Paul, a life sharer here, and we'll get to this later, but I just want to read it to you. Let's read verses 19 through 23 in the same chapter. This is Paul sharing. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself servant to all that I might be win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. And to those who are under the law as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. For those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. 
Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. Paul's going beyond, oh yes, I'm a skillful preacher, or yes, I'm a skillful administrator, or yes, I'm even a skillful tent maker, or yes, I'm a, I'm a guy who gets things done, and Paul was a guy who got things done. Be sure of that. Anybody who took the missionary journeys he did, with the means at his disposal, highwaymen, robbers, ships that don't always go in the directions you want them to, shipwrecks, the possibility. He really took some trips that were extremely dangerous, but yet he got it done again and again. He was a man who got things done, but you know what? He's saying all of that pales in comparison to what I really want to do. I will share my life in order to promote the gospel. You know, we know this, don't we? We know this as moms and dads from the very beginning, do we not? Try to uh, administer your family, your home, from a neat little compact tower that you built. Maybe, maybe you come home each day and moms could climb up a little tower, right? A little tower, and uh, from one high, you guys like give directives to the family. Clean your room. Well, wash the dishes. The refrigerator's gonna be a mess. Let's straighten that up. You just stand there and, and, and just direct everybody. Your own little pulpit, if you will. We know that can never work in your home. But I would argue that it can't work in the church either. And Paul certainly was not going to be that guy. Here's the problem, my friends. I think the Corinthians wanted him to be that guy. Because if the minister gets to separate his life from you, then you know the, you know the flip side, right? Then you get to hide your life from the minister. And isn't that nice? We have a nice little pastor who preaches to us every once a Sunday, doesn't know anything about my life, I don't know anything about his. And Paul, my friends, was opposite of that. If you, if you desire the ministry, I'm talking to everybody here, especially the young folks this morning, if you desire the ministry, make sure that you desire to share your life with those to whom you minister. Because if all you want to be is Mr. Proclaimer, no one's going to listen. You're not going to be effective. We have an illustration of that going on right now, don't we? Nobody's on a higher plane than the Holy Father. <coughs> He's coming in September, I guess, to Philadelphia. Can I follow what that guy says? <clears throat> you know, he has a, he, it's an amazing thing to me. He has all this adulation. And he, he, he says all the craziest things if you follow what he says and does. Many of which are opposite of what previous popes have said, and he still has the same has, has the same attention. You know what? I get it that everyone wants to see him. And I don't know, maybe we can sell t-shirts. I don't know. I don't really get it. I mean, I get it that people want to see him. But I, and as far as his actual ministry to people to whom he's going to be speaking, I don't see it. I don't see it at all. Now, this Pope is saying some crazy things, but I, I, I challenge you to run into anybody who says, you know what? This Pope is really ministering to me. And he's made me reevaluate my life in the light of what he's saying. And you know what? I'm going to change my life around to be more like the Pope. Now, my friends, he's so far away. If there was ever an example of what a Christian minister is not supposed to be, that would be the Pope. So I urge you 
If you want a minister, look at the Pope. Do the opposite. And you just might be an effective minister. Shall we pray? We thank you, O Lord, for your wonderful servant, Paul, who, who, who really spread his life around everyone who wanted to look at it. And the same with our Lord Jesus Christ, who came baby in a manger and who shared his life with those 12 and with others as well, but who shared his life, who didn't hide it at all. I pray, O Lord, that in this church you would raise up many godly ministers Ministers at home, ministers in the street, ministers in the church, many, many ministers, that your name and your kingdom would spread throughout this entire earth, and that the earth would truly be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, and that Independence Reformed Bible Church would have had a tremendous part in that. We pray in the name of Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.